Alright guys, next up we're going to look at some pre-deployment validation. There's been some talks today talking about how we can start looking at automated testing and really gain more confidence in what automation can bring to us. Right? Ajay talked about Ansible, how we can leverage Ansible for network deployments. But one of the key points that was highlighted this morning is around how, how do we start to gain more confidence? What types of tests can we do? And so Samir from Attention is going to kind of talk through some of the things that, that he's seeing in the market with their platform to see how that could be um, helpful in adopting really end-to-end -end automation testing. Thanks, Jason. Hopefully caffeine's kicked in. I know it's been a long day. We're getting close to the end of the day, so try to keep it lively. So what I want to talk about today is sort of how do you leverage, you know, the promise of automation by moving fast, being agile, being fast, uh, scaling. But how do you do that in a way where you don't break things? So that's the talk. Move fast and don't break things by using pre-deployment validation. Just a little bit of background on us. So my name's Spear Freak. I'm the head of product for IntentionNet. At IntentionNet, we are a Seattle-based startup. We were founded in 2015. Uh, we're funded by True Ventures, the National Science Foundation, and the US Air Force. And our mission, quite simply, is to help network engineers move fast without breaking things. So who's talking, I want to talk about more about how you do that, what do I mean by that, how we can help you with that. So one of the principles that we see a, a lot in the conversation around network automation is speed, right? So upgrade that old Chevette to Corvette, go very fast, scale. But the thing where, that we always need to be aware of is how do I do that in a safe way? How do I not break things? How do I not crash? And so think of pre-deployment validation as those safety features for your network automation speed. So think of it as like the lane departure warning system, your brakes, your LIDAR, right? It's there to help you move fast, but safely. So that's really the, the premise around it. Like how, do you, how do we move faster in the network world? How do we react quicker to the application needs and the business needs, but do it in a safe way so that we're not getting that 2 a.m. call saying, hey, you know, something's busted up the network, now go fix it. But these are sort of new terms, so I want to level set a little bit about what I mean by pre-deployment validation. I think the pre-deployment part, you know, fairly self-expansion rates, before we deploy a change to the network, before we touch the network, I want to undertake these validation tasks. Right? And obviously I also want to do post-deployment post validation, but Today, I specifically want to talk about pre-deployment validation. The area where there's some, probably a little more confusion is what do you mean by validation? There isn't a universal definition, right? In conversations I have with customers and other companies, you know, people talk about validation as testing, they talk about it as verification, it's very, it's used interchangeably. The way I like to think of it is validation is about your, an attempt to prove a hypothesis, right? So your goal is, I'm going to make this change and I expect it not to impact my network. So that's a hypothesis, and validation is about making sure that that holds true. But the main thing to think about in the context of validation is what I think about is scope. So when you think about validation, we think like three primary scopes. Right? Unit testing. So think of unit testing as I want to validate the individual, check something about an individual device config. So I'm going to make sure that the NTP server is set to 10.1.1.1 on a given device, or all my devices in one data center. And then you have functional testing, right? So think of functional testing around, I want to look at specific network behaviors. It's like, I want to make sure that I can get an SSH packet from host one to host two. Right? That's a very specific network behavior that you want to make sure is, hold, holds true in your network. And then the third category is what we call verification, right? And this is where you're trying to check your network behavior for all possible scenarios. So this is where you're trying to find out, to answer the question is, make sure that no packet can get from A to B that is not SSH or SSO, right? So rather than a very specific network behavior, you're looking for something that is a specific property that needs to hold you across the network, across all possible network scenarios. And so that's how we sort of think about validation uh, as a whole. And we've written a blog, it's it got the URL at the bottom there, that goes into a lot more detail around sort of the taxonomy of validation and the different techniques you can use. So, but how do you actually implement this? Well. We have a solution called Batfish, and that's sort of how we're talking about how you implement network validation uh, in your system today. So Batfish, a little bit of background, started as a research project in 2012. It was funded by Microsoft Research in collaboration with researchers at UCLA and USC. And then it was open source in 2014, so it's open source under Apache 2 license. 
Since then, we've been growing the contributor community. So we've got contributions from a number of other universities, from other private companies like VBM, uh, Microsoft continues to contribute. And it's been deployed in multiple Fortune 500 companies right now. Go, there's a GitHub page. If you go to our GitHub page, you can get started pretty easily. And there's a lot of docs. and pointers at the back of the deck as well. So what can you do with Batfish? So when we think of what you can do with Batfish, there's sort of four broad categories that we think about. One is really pretty simple, obvious thing, right? Audit configuration settings. Yeah, all my devices comply with the site standard. You know, data center one, everybody needs to use the, sys the same syslog server. Is that fully true? Or I've made this config change, I want to make sure that all my sessions are going to come up. So I've got a bunch of BGP peers, make sure all the BGP sessions are going to be up. I've got IPsec tunnels configured, make sure everything's configured correctly so the tunnels actually get established. You know, there are crypto maps and keys on both sides. And my configuration, etc. Anything that's sort of session based. It does a routing and porting simulation. So you can ask Batfish to tell you what are all the rooms and fibs of all the network devices. Uh, and you can actually ask it why a route was installed on a given network device. We do comprehensive reachability analysis. So you can start asking questions around can any flow violate this cross site of isolation? So if you have a secure enclave and nothing but SSH is supposed to get there from any part of your network, you can ask questions about which to make sure that that holds true. Or if you're running a service that's globally accessible, like your DNS service or any other application that everybody in your network or even outside your network should be able to have access to, you can query to make sure that holds true. And then you can also do things around security, around comprehensive sort of firewall and ACL analysis. We can talk about, you know, I've got a very long, complex ACL. Is every rule actually going to take it effect? Right? Because Let's face it, when you look at a 4,000 line ACL, there's no way for you to know which ones are actually being hit and which ones are not going to get hit. And then, more importantly, if I'm going to make a change, what is the impact of that change on that ACL, or on the behavior of that ACL, and on the behavior of the network as a whole? So let's talk about how Batfish works. So at its foundation, Batfish operates purely on network configurations. So the beauty of Batfish, and the reason it's useful for pre-deployment validation, is you can think of it as an offline analysis tool. It doesn't talk to your network device. It's not pulling any information from the network device. It's not pushing any information from the network device. It's purely operating on configurations that you've extracted and sent to the service. And those can be physical devices, virtual devices, cloud instances. It has support for all the popular platforms, and we're constantly adding new vendors into the mix. So, you know, all your Juniper devices, including SR Access, QFX, MX, all your Arista, all your different Cisco variations, whether it's iOS, iOS XE. OS XR and XOS, Cumulus, F5 load balancers, Palo Alto firewalls, and many more, right? AWS uh, cloud instances. And so the way it works is we take these device configurations, these entities, and then we create a series of network models. There's three primary models that we build with Batfish. The first one is purely a vendor neutral representation of all the configurations. We try to normalize everything. So you know, Cisco has a different way of specifying interface attributes than Juniper. We normalize it into an internal JSON data model. So we have one view looking at everything. And that's the basis for these very simple checks around configuration settings. Right? I don't have to worry about how an NTP server is defined in Cisco or Juniper. I have a key in my data model that says NTP servers. I can check that against any value that I want. The second thing we do is a set of routing models. So based on the configurations, we build a full routing for you. So Core, one of the core things of Batfish is this route and forwarding simulation. So we have models built around how all the different vendors handle their routing protocol configurations and how they establish sessions, how they exchange routes, how they operate on routing policies. And so we can build those out. And then the third thing we build is a set of mathematical behavior models, which is more the abstract models. This is the thing that allows us to ask questions around, can any packet go from site A to site B? Or can any packet that's not SSH go from site A to site B? We take these models and they run it through our analysis engine that is then evaluating your network policy. And so all this comes together in this form of an output that tells you a list of certifications saying, you know, I have a policy that says all devices are password protected, or and a set of violations. Subnets from one leaf to another cannot talk to each other, so their hosts and those subnets can't communicate. Or, if I have a rule around no single point of failure, I can say, hey, this router, if it fails, is going to reduce, uh, it's going to cause an outage. It's going to impact service X, Y, or Z. And these network policies are pretty flexible. 
we sort of see three broad categories of network policies. You know, security being the obvious one, uh, you know, making sure that you find, if you have an isolated application first, that no traffic can cross those isolation boundaries. If you've got a branch office using IPsec, you know, common problem. You know, you think you've got IPsec running, but it's just doing plain GRE, it's not encrypted, it's going over the internet in plain text. How do you make sure that those sessions, the tunnels are open, the traffic is always using the tunnel? And then the other part is how do you prevent somebody else from hijacking your own prefix space? Right? How do you prevent some entity from telling you, hey, this route should be a tunnel network? Actually, so you should send the traffic to me instead. You can write policies on reliability, so there should be no single link failure that in my network could cause an outage, because let's face it, most people are building networks, there's at least two of everything. Two links between devices, two devices per function, et cetera. I have a data center fabric, I need, you know, I'm implementing policy in the edge, so I want complete routing from leaf to leaf, so that every subnet on every leaf is present on every other leaf. And then I have things like DNS servers that want to be globally accessible uh, under all circumstances. And then, last sort of categories, things like compliance, right? You, know, you hear about you know, NIST standards, NIST sticks, you know, your own compliance standards around, you know, only SSH addresses have access to the device. Uh, you've got very specific site standards around how many ATP servers, what's the primary, what's the backup. Uh, and then things like no undefined references. You know, with certain vendors, you can define an ACL that references, you know, uh, an object that doesn't exist. Or you can define a route map that references an ACL that doesn't exist. And that gives you very undefined behavior in the network. And so you can now write these as compliance rules and then run it through Netfish, which will enforce that across your network and it guarantees that these properties are going to hold true for all possible packets, all possible link failures, and all the external routing announcements. So I'm going to show you a set of demos, but before I get into that, I'm just going to talk about some of the use cases for Netfish. So there's two primary use cases we see. You know, obviously, you talk about automation. CIC pipelines, that's their primary use case. That's what we're really driving the investment in Mapfish around. That's what we're building for is how do we help you in an automated fashion make sure that any change you're about to make is completely safe to make. So we want to be that CI system for your CIC pipeline. And obviously, whatever you do before you deploy, you can also do it after you deploy so you get that continuous deployment uh, test validation as well. But even if you haven't gotten your CIC pipeline built, you're not fully down the automation path, we can help you test very specific network scenarios. Right? So we have users that are about any network maintenance models. So it might be as simple as, I want to cost out a router, let me make sure that my process to cost out the router is not going to create an outage. Or I'm making an ACL change, I'm redoing my viral policies for my order, I've got new services coming online, I'm retiring old services. How do I validate that change that I'm about to make has just the impact right now? Or you're doing disaster recovery, you've got a backup site, you've got a plan, you know, before you actually go and actually implement your plan, let's make sure that I can mimic those steps in the validation system to make sure that those steps are not going to create any outages. So I want to walk you through a set of demos. Uh, there's three demos that I've recorded. It wasn't quite as brave as the earlier presenters. I wanted to record it so I didn't have to worry about the demo guys frowning upon me. Uh, so there's three demos. One's going to be a CI demo, talking about how you can use Batfish in a fully automated environment. And the two are actually more interactive validation. So we're going to validate a network maintenance model, and then we're going to validate a security policy change. And the first demo, if you, anybody who was at Nanog recently, one of my colleagues, Dan Halpern, actually did this demo at Nanog. So the scenario was a simple one, you know, I want to cost out a core router for maintenance, and obviously everything's redundant, as you can see from the network, uh, so I expect no impact, right? There should be no impact for, from this change. And the way we've set it up, is I'm going to make a change in my source control, which in this example is GitHub, but be any source control, BitPocket, Trapta, or GitLab. I'm going to commit that to a branch, and I'm going to trigger my CI system. So Travis is my overall CI system. Uh, again, it could be Jenkins, it could be whatever you choose under the, under the covers. Travis then, through webhooks, pulls the artifacts it needs from GitHub. It's going to then trigger a build and a, and a validation through Batfish. It's going to collect the results and it's going to deposit it back into that in the original PR uh, that you saw. So I just jumped in. So here I've got my GitHub repo set up with everything. I've got my configs. Here's the sort of, like I said, the simple example of what the network looks like. I'm going to cost out core one as part of this. So I'm just going to go directly to the configs and I'm going to edit that. Now, in this example, I'm editing configs directly. Uh, 
But this very well could just be YAML files that is input to generate your configs, right? So you can still have the config generation pipeline, but rather than editing raw configs, you're just editing the YAML files that is going to generate your configs. So in this example, my cost out procedure is I'm just going to increase the OSPF interface cost so that everything sort of runs around. Set everything to 500. I'll give it a nice little description. Or create a, a new branch for that. And the way the webhooks are set up, so GitHub has a webhook into Travis. So every time there's a new pull request on any branch, that triggers uh, a build in Travis. So while that's breaking off, you can see sort of the diffs. And now at this point, the Travis, the CI build has been triggered. I can go to my console, I can see the details of the Travis build, I can follow the log links to get to the actual Travis logs. So it's just now kicking off. And some of these sequences, you know, have been shortened just to sort of fit into the window. And now all of a sudden Travis is finished and I see a failure. Pause right here. So, what I have underneath the covers, I have a PyTest Py running with Travis. And I've defined a series of tests. And in this specific case, my test is a reachability test. Because I knew that I've got a redundant network and I'm making a change that should have no impact. My test is, I should have no impact. There should be no difference in reachability. So no flows that were previously admitted or carried on the network should be dropped now. And so I've written that as a test using the underlying pilot APIs that Batfish provides. And what I see here is, that test is actually failing. And so what this, my Travis logger is telling me is, okay, I found a change in reachability. And if I dig into the details, I'm gonna see, I see this difference on this border router. So traffic that used to enter that border router going to that specific destination. Before, it is now getting dropped by 4.2 because of a static null route, and in the past, it used to be delivered all the way to the endpoint itself. And I see there's two examples of the flow, same thing if it comes in border two, I have the same behavior. So, you know, I've given, you know, what Batfish has given me is a very concrete example of a failure, and enough information to root cause it. So I know there's something wrong in core two, I find that static null route that's there, same process, I can go in and edit the config here, So is it, is it accurate to say that Batfish will determine what the router looks like just based on the configuration? Absolutely, yeah. It's one of the core things that we do is, based on configurations, do a full route simulation. So we've got built-in models for all the different vendors we support in terms of how they process routing configs and how they actually operate, how they exchange information, uh, et cetera. So you're not actually using like containers or anything, you're just relying with all that. Yeah, so this is pure simulation. So there's no emulation behind the scenes because that's the only way to really scale it. And that, one, that gives us the ability to be sort of production scale. Because you know, emulation is very useful, but the one thing is it's not ever mimic, it doesn't ever mimic sort of one-to-one -one production network looks like. Right? Once you get a large enough uh, network and a, enough device types, it sort of uh, doesn't scale that well. And so this demo's gonna play on, so I made that change, and I expect it to pass, it's great. You know, if this is my automation system at this point, you can either Creating an alert in Slack. I've done that integration saying, hey, this change is ready. You can commit it. Uh, you can push it to the network, whatever you want to do at that point. You know that this change is now safe to make. So, a quick recap on what, you know, what this demo is all about it's showing you how, in an automated CI environment, like Batfish can be used to make sure that any change you're about to make in the network is safe to make. And you know, very quickly in this little demo, you're able to see that Batfish found a potential issue that would cost an outage, and also gave you enough information to very easily figure out what the right fix is. So now, before your maintenance window, if you're going to do that cost out, you should first change that other core router, get rid of that static route, and then you can do the cost out procedure. So, you know, the cool thing about this is you can do this anytime before you're planning your maintenance window. So do this during the day, run through and validate all your steps, and then when you're ready to do your maintenance, you can go take on that activity and know that it's not going to create an outage. The second demo was similar in nature, but I'm going to interact. So, you know, on top of Batfish, which is our open source offering, we had intention to build what we call Batfish Enterprise, 
And one of the aspects of that is this interactive web dashboard that allows you to use the core capabilities of Atfish even if you haven't fully implemented an automation pipeline. And so I've got a slightly different network that I'm going to use for the next two demos. And here I want to cost out again another redundant router. And I'm going to do that interactively for the UI. And again, I expect no impact because everything's redundant in my network. So Batfish has been preloaded with two network snapshots. So you see snapshot zero and snapshot one. And they're just the two latest running versions of the network configuration. And we have the sandbox feature, which allows me to interact with Batfish and propose changes to the network. And I can propose multiple types of changes. So first I'm going to go find my router that I want to cost out. And I can propose multiple changes. I can either edit the config right there, I can put it under maintenance so I can tell Batfish, hey, just assume this network, this device is off. Or if I turn it off, I can say, hey, this device is coming back online, return it to service. So I've got three sort of actions that I built into the sandbox. So in this case, I'm going to put it under maintenance. And it's very quick, easy talk to saying, okay, just turn off all, the entire device, not just some interfaces. I'm going to apply that. I'm going to give it a name, which is something descriptive so I know what I was trying to do. I'm going to initiate the change analysis. And all of a sudden, the first thing that's going to happen is as soon as Batfish has finished processing the snapshot, recomputing the routing and forwarding tables based on the chains, it's taking me to this reachability comparison maker. So when I was talking about the comprehensive reachability analysis, Batfish is computing all flows that were carried before that are no longer carried, that I'm trying to display it to you in this you know, safety format. So think about it, it's like it gives you a flow, allows us to visually show you the different flows that are impacted. And so a couple of things you'll see real quick is Batfish is telling me that my reachability has decreased. So I've blocked their flows that were carried before that are no longer carried. And the way to actually read this diagram is the leftmost column is start location. So every place where a potential packet could arrive into my network. This is what we call destination location. So it's any place where I was sending the packet to. So it's like my top of crack switch is connected to uh, my server, is my order connected from data center one to data center two, et cetera. This is the destination IP space. So this is telling me what IP subnets are impacted by uh, this change. And then, you know, if I had things that meant, cared about IP protocols and destination ports or any of the layer four information, I would see that over here. So what I see here is I've got two buckets of locations. This one is 45 locations. This one is a single location that have impacts to different destinations. This is, uh, and then we'll zoom into that and see what exactly those mean. So these are all the in possible input interfaces in my network, in this little data, data set network that I had defined. And all of them have an, app, have an impact going to those three destination locations for those five subnets. So this is telling me clearly there's something wrong with routing because it doesn't care about the IP protocol, it doesn't care about the destination port. I've got very specific, I have a large group of input locations that can't get to certain subnets. And so now, once I know that there's an issue, I can use this that same sandbox feature to actually troubleshoot the problem. So I know I took this router out of maintenance, I know the cluster, uh, so this is the cluster that was impacted. So there's three destinations that we saw that were in the reachability matrix are these top of X, which is in that one server. So now I'm just going to go try to look at the config of one of these and see if I can find what that routing issue was that caused that outage. We're going to pick that top of X, which we're going to edit the config. We have a handy config editor. So here I search for how do I connect to that distribution switch router? It's a very specific interface. So I want to look at the routing config for that interface. And I can see right there that I have found an errant passive interface statement. So even though my network was redundant, I had it yet configured, I forgot at some point, somehow that passive interface statement was there. When both distribution routers were active, it didn't matter. So we picked one, I was able to have all my services were up and running. So the minute I take one of them out of service, I see this issue. But, you know, let's make sure that this is the only issue. So I can delete that line. I can look at the change I was about to make. I can see that, okay, the only change is this line that I deleted. Save that. And then I'm going to initiate a change. So now, on top of my 
maintenance activity, I've initiated, I've added this incremental config change. And now, that fish has gone and recomputed the impact of those two changes together relative to my last running snapshot of the network. And it's telling me that there are no changes in reachability. So now I know that when I want to take on that maintenance activity later on, first thing I need to do is get rid of that passive interface statement. And once I do that, I can safely take that other device out of service, and I have no impact on my, on my network whatsoever. Those changes are now safe to make. So again, similar to the first one, what we're able to see over here is interactively, rather than in an automated environment, I can test out a change, and I can make this activity. I can prevent an outage. I was able to diagnose why that outage would have happened, and I can fix that, and then validate that fix as well. Because maybe that was, there was only one, that was one of the many big issues I had to fix. I can interactively and iteratively go through and use Batfish to help me find all the problems in the network that I can, need to go fix before I take out that maintenance activity. So the third demo, I actually want to do a security policy update. So in this scenario, I want, I'm about to retire small fail servers. I'm standing up some new ones. I want to stage my network to accommodate that. And to do that, I have, to, I have border ACLs on my tours, and I have a central firewall that uh, manages all traffic coming into the data center. So I need to add support for port 25 and 2525 for this specific subnet so that I can have the mail access from inside and outside my network. So let's see what that looks like. So I'm going to deploy these changes on these two top direct switches. So this is where the mail servers are going to be connected. So I'm going to go back into that sandbox feature of Batfish Enterprise. I'm going to select the first top direct switch. I'm going to edit the config. I pre the configs in a text file so I don't have to remember to delivery command. But I know that there's one output ACL meant for that port. I'm just going to add it to the end of that output ACL. Quick check. The only change is where I lines I wanted to add. <coughs> Save that. Now I'm going to go back and change the next, the pair of the top of right switch. Even though I know those changes, are, you know, that's all I've made, I always like to review it. It's a quick review, make sure there's nothing else. Now finally, I have to go to the firewall, and I need to open up the ports on the firewall. Now again, I already have mail servers active, so what I'm going to first do is I'm going to define a new, a new address group for the new mail servers, I'm going to add it back into the existing address group for the existing mail servers. And then that way, it's sort of, I, my existing rule will be sufficient. But I also want to open up a new port, so I have to define this new application uh, on my Juniper SRX, saying SMTP 2525. I'm going to go back and find my, the rules that allow mail access from outside. I'm just going to open up that extra application on SMTP. So to find the new address, I've added it to the existing address set, updated the existing role that allows mail access into the data center, got my port defined, so I'm ready to go. Save that, let's call it add new mail servers. So now, same thing. As soon as it parses the configs, it's going to then figure out what are all the reachability changes here. Now, in this case, I'm adding access to a new service, so I expect there to be an increase in reachability. I'm expecting a difference. But what I want to make sure is, is it the right difference? So right off the bat, I see, okay, my reachability has increased, which is good. There's no decrease. So I haven't taken anything out of service that was already in service. Uh, but I, I have increased reachability, so that's a positive. So as I go through it, it's like I can see, okay, from the app, from all my internal locations in the network, going to these two top of rack switches, I've added X port to get to that IP subnet for TCP 25 to 2525. But the problem is, 
I have also opened up access to my existing mail servers for port 2525 from outside my network. So the way they're sort of read this is packets coming in from my firewall destined to these destination IPs that are connected to these top of rack for these TCP ports are now allowed when they weren't before. And that clearly wasn't my goal. It's like I'm about to retire these servers. I don't want to open up another port on them. I don't want 2525 access on those. So I need to go back and fix that. And again, I'll do the same thing. I'll go back to my sandbox. I can edit those configs. And so the first thing I'm going to do is, in this case, I'm going to delete that port 2525 access for the old mail servers. And then what I probably should have done from the beginning is just created a new rule in the firewall for the new servers themselves rather than trying to piggyback on the existing rule. That way, when I do retire the old servers, I can just delete that old rule, and there's no impact whatsoever. So I see I deleted the line that I wanted to. Got a quick my condition, save my changes, get the new descriptive name. And now, once again, I see there's a difference. I see that it's an increase only, which is great, but. I also see that the only impact is to this destination subnet for these ports. And that's it. And that's exactly what I was expecting. So now, with Batfish interactively, I was able to figure out, I'm making a change. I know exactly what the change should do. I can validate that the impact of the change is exactly what I wanted to do. And so you were able to do this and sort of, you know, I was able to prevent a security vulnerability from making it a production. Right? Maybe somebody would have taken advantage of that open port on those old mail servers, maybe not but this is a way to sort of make sure that your changes are having the exact impact that you want. So, and so we're gonna wrap up real quick. Getting started with Batfish is pretty easy. We've got a ton of resources out there on the community site, so if you go to GitHub, there's a Docker. We can be delivery Docker container. It's very easy to load it up and get started. We put out a ton of tutorials and videos with those tutorials on how to get started uh, with the different Python APIs. You can also find us on the ATC Slack channel. We have runbatfish.org Slack. Uh, and remember, when you want to move fast and not, don't break things, think of Batfish. Uh, it's there to help you make your changes safely. That, I'll take questions. It, so we are, right now, the layers of support is pretty minimal. We are adding layers of support, but we do understand we plan trunks and we do create bridge domains across it. We don't do spanning trees, so we're not fully reasoning about the layers of code. Pardon? So let's Oh, thank you. And you just mentioned earlier how you're able to import a variety of devices into your own language. Do you have to export to the So we don't export, we won't generate configs in the target language, so that's not something we do yet. But you can, everything that we create in our internal data model, we, we can export that. So you can dump that to a file. So you can turn that into your source of truth, saying, okay, I've got a vendor neutral representation of all my device configs uh, so that you can create a sort of standard source of truth if you wanted to. Like, we are in, in the fullness of time down the road, we are going to take on synthesis, saying, okay, now that I can parse configs, I can actually even generate uh, configs in the target vendor format, but that's not something that's in the solution. Where are the CI pipelines which you recommend the Batfish testing? obviously there's multiple steps to talk about. Is there a recommended place where you do it? Uh, so we generally recommend right after config generation. So it's like, you know, we see a lot of people doing, you know, you're going to do some basic linting, make sure your data input is clean, your AML formatting, et cetera. And then as soon as you generate the configs, that's the right time to have that, uh, to kick off some tests with that fish. Because it needs to, it needs the entire network configs to, to evaluate, to give you the right answers, but that would be the right place. Is there any, <clears throat> so you guys obviously know a lot of work around kind of interpreting the configs. Um, are you able to just work straight out with the game models or, or something that's already better neutral or, or more abstract? So today, the short answer is no, uh, but it's not that, it would not be very hard for us to do because a Yang model is actually structured. So a lot of the work that goes behind the scenes here is parsing. So we spend a lot of time, a lot of energy writing very general handler-based parsers to parse all the different uh, vendor configs. 
And so parsing a Yang model would actually be pretty easy, but we don't do that today. But we have had people ask us, hey, like when I fed you a Wikipedia Yang models or ITF Yang models, could you parse that and operate on that? It's definitely something we're thinking about taking on, but it's not there yet. Sure. Why the name Batfish? Uh, I wish there was a really good story behind it. Uh, Ari was one of the guys that wrote a lot of the original code and is one of the founders of the company. When he was naming the project to put it on GitHub, he just he wanted it to be a fish and he just started going down a list and found that fish that wasn't taken and that was it. So yeah. it's not like it's not an exciting story. I think maybe for my next presentation we'll come up with a better a better way. All right, perfect. All right, thank you so much. Thanks everybody.